Okay, so let's get into this war play thing. How can you train and fight the internal and the external war, which buys time for those who are negative, and at the same time, how do you want to call it, optimizes your own spiritual growth? Hey, practice it. You know, when you got piano, you have a lot of things that are concepts to learn. But then you got to practice. When you got chemistry, you got a lot of concepts to learn, but then you got to practice. So it, that's true in anything. Okay? You got stuff to learn that's like book learning, which is the book for us. But then how do you practice it? Beneath that question of practice is a mindset. You have to like envision the big picture. And once you can see the big picture, then it becomes easier to figure out the placement of any individual action or decision you make. Okay? In the Christian life, typically, we never get the big picture. It's not taught in pulpits. Okay? And therefore, you spend a lot of time repeating actions that you really don't know what they're for and what they do. Even though all the information's in the Bible, nobody gives you a way to see the big picture so you can put it all together. That's what I've been trying to do here. I was one of the lucky ones. Um, my pastor kept on focusing on the big picture when he exegeted Bible verse by verse. He would always relate the specific thing he was talking about to the life. And he'd always put it in a context of the big picture and specifically the angelic conflict. So I've had a lot of training in this as far as the concepts go. And by this point, if you're still listening to these audios, you've, you've got a sense of the big picture, but we haven't really dealt with how do you play the head games in your own head on a daily basis. I spent some time on that in episode 8. You know, you have to consider yourself a king. You have to consider everything you're touching as your property. It's your kingdom. How do you rule on it? You know, you're a public person, you're on divine television. You know, there were seven basic um, categories of ways to think during a day. But now we're going to get a little more specific and hopefully introduce some practical tips. Okay. For example, you're a king in training. That's the, that's the big picture purpose here. You just no matter what else is going on in the world, you're more important. Okay? And that seems like everything I'm going to start saying is going to sound like the antithesis of what most Christians would even think right or true. But see, your life as we ended in the last increment, you, or one before that, your life is just like Christ's. That's the whole idea here. You face the same situation that he faced down here. You start to get the knowledge and you realize that everybody around you is clueless. And it's very depressing when that happens. But it takes some years before you see the, that big picture too. So now you start practicing. Look, my life is supposed to be just like Christ. I have the same, my pastor said this a thousand times. We have the same spiritual life that Christ had. Christ in you, the confidence of glory that, you know, that's covered in Colossians 1. That's a big book on the conflict. Um, you've got the whole book of Hebrews and you've got Galatians 3 through 5. And, of course, the entire book of Romans is on this topic. Okay, if you were to start trying to get a read on the big picture, you really ought to start in Romans. But you, it, it's never taught. Okay, the big picture is not taught. You're given lots of little homilies and do's and morality and, you know, little chirpy things like God is love. And you never see the big picture because, frankly, the theologians don't know what it is. 
So here's what it is. You're a king in training. The minute you believed in Christ, that's what you became. That's your destiny. You, me, every single person who's ever believed in Christ, we all have that goal. It's a marathon race to get there. It's battlefield royalty. That's Psalm 110. That's what Christ inherited on the cross. That's why the book of Hebrews covers Psalm 110, is to explain that. He's our archagos, that's Hebrews 12, our leader, our progenitor, our author, our originator of a spiritual life that we are, in Peter's terms, to copy. Greek word is hupogrammas. You notice how I'm jumping all over the Bible to try to show you where the books are so you can start to read this big picture yourself. Talk to God about this. You know, I can always summarize the high points. You're a king in training that who you are. Everything in your life, therefore, is for that purpose. God is going to let you or take you down. And he's going to either let you or take you up. Everything is designed to train you. Now, what kind of analogy will work for you so that you can role play this during your day? Well... Do you know anything about royalty and royalty life and royalty training? Have you ever, you know, is that an interest of yours that you know something about? Well, then use that analogy because that's the most apt. A royal is assiduously trained from birth. He's trained to be a public person. He's trained to restrain himself. He's got certain privileges that, you know, the common people don't have, and he's trained in that. He's trained to respect the fact that, yes, he's higher, but he isn't allowed to think of himself first. He thinks about the polity first, because he's going to rule it someday. And everything with the royal life is procedure and principle and precedence and history. And here's your role, here's your destiny, here's what royalty means. And it's always about being in public, being self-controlled. Okay? You always have to worry about your appearance. I'm not talking about, you know, egocentric. It's a procedure. It's just like, you know, military. You have to worry about dress codes. You have to worry about, about customs. You have to worry about traditions. Now, how do you translate all that into your life? Well, everybody around you is watching you. Not to mention the unseen audience I mentioned in the last in increment. Everybody around you is watching you, too. They're not aware, necessarily, that you're a Christian. But they will become aware at some point. God will introduce you. God is going to deploy you in certain situations. You don't have to go seek it. He's going to deploy you. You have your own specific group of folks who need to hear from your lips your understanding of Bible. That's training for you, and it's, it's more convenient and, um, what do you want to call it, efficient for them. In other words, the way your soul works and the way you talk is going to be most compatible with certain other individuals, and they need to hear your way of saying it. And it will click with them. Okay, that's what the same kind of doctrine is right pastor. There's a pastor out there for each of us. He's not doesn't have to be in any given denomination. But the way he talks and the way he packages information will click with his sheep. Now you're not a pastor with sheep, but you are a person who communicates. We all do. And there are certain people who when they hear you talk, it's going to work for them. And when you hear them talk, it's going to work for you. Everybody's assigned, unless God wants you to be, you know, single. Everybody's assigned some, you know, opposite number to have to marry. That's what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 7. you got a right job. You have a right place to be. You know, everything's that there's a precise, as my pastor like to call it, it's protocol. There's a precisely correct procedure. Well, that's totally the way the royal has to live. Everything in the royal's life is scheduled. And he gets perks to go with it, too. You get a lot of perks that you don't even know about yet. But the issue is, okay, I'm royal, I'm public. Every single minute of my day, there is a will of God for my life. What should I be thinking? What should I be doing? Where should I go? 
And you have to keep on, in the beginning especially, just be aware that that's the story. You won't know what to do with it. That's okay. But you need to cultivate the habit of thinking about yourself as an entity. You are in training to be a king of a polity. You will own the people and the property. And they will want that. If you grow up in Christ, this is the best gift that the people you're going to rule over could get. Because they didn't want to learn Christ down here. And once they see him, they're going to wish they had. And they're going to, they're going to have all kinds of yearnings. Okay? And, and you're a gift to them and they're a gift to you. That's basically how it works. So you're going to be setting all the rules. You're going to be setting all the policies, the procedures. There are going to be traditions that are going to be in your name. You're going to be front page news. In every newspaper in your kingdom, every single day, every single thing you say is going to be vastly important to a whole bunch of people. That is something a royal, even in this world, down here, is trained in knowing from day one. And it starts with becoming aware of that. Just aware of it. You can't, you, you know, it's like, well, what do I do? Well, you won't know. I mean, when you started out as a baby, you first learned the alphabet. You didn't know how to make words. You didn't know how to make anything. You just got fed and fed and fed and fed and fed. Well, that's what, that's how the spiritual life works, too. So you have to, you have to like ask, God, look, there's certain thinking skills I gotta learn. Everything I do, I must be aware of myself as an entity. That's thinking of yourself objectively. That's how Christ had to think. He had to know he's Messiah. Every minute he's alive, I'm Messiah. Because I'm Messiah, I must think this. Because I'm Messiah, I must do that. Okay? You have to orient to your own destiny, and the actual orientation doesn't occur till much later. But if you want to speed it along or grow faster or, or at, at least have a more, in, uh, how do you want to call it, productive time of it, you have to start thinking about yourself that way now, just to be aware of it. And of course, you know, God will, God knows what you need to learn that day. And you want to be asking, what am I learning, Dad? How should I be thinking, Dad? You want to develop those thought questions as habits, just look right along with 1 John 1 9. And you have to become aware, this is who I am. You are a king in training, that's who you are. That's the will of God for every believer. But most believers are going to quit. They're going to abdicate by the end of their lives. Because it's like a marathon race. You have to keep going and going and going and going. And you get tired and you stop and then you go again. That's how it works. It's like exercise. You know, it's very, it's got very much all the same characteristics in terms of the modality of it as everything else in your life. You don't learn the whole Bible in one day. You don't eat all the meals that you're ever going to eat in your lifetime in one day. A little bit today, a little bit tomorrow. You have failure, you have success. They're always right alongside. Because both are used to train you. It's not about whether you fail. It's about whether you keep getting up. It's not about whether you succeed. It's about whether you keep getting up. You are a king in training. What does that mean? Okay, the second analogy that might fit is you have to think of yourself as like an executive. You're in charge. Okay, well, if you're in charge, what decisions do you make? What policies do you set? What rules do you make? You're doing that already in your secular life. When you get up in the morning, you plan your day. You have certain rules that you've developed for yourself. You know if you're an early morning riser or not. And, and you know you decide whether you're going to take a shower the night before or whether you're going to take a shower in the morning. And you learn to objectively think about yourself. Okay, these are my strengths. These are my weaknesses. You're evaluating yourself like you would a computer, a business deal, a potential purchase, a project. That's what you are. And you have to learn to think about yourself that way. Now notice, if you're so busy starting to try to learn these habits of thinking, 
then sin and temptation don't have the same kind of foothold that they would have if you weren't doing this kind of thinking. New temptations will arise. Okay? The immature cannot handle authority and power. And that's why a royal is trained in obey, 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 obey. There are a thousand rules that a royal has to remember. But they're all executive roles. Okay? So if you can't handle, if you don't know enough about the royalty metaphor, then go for the executive metaphor or parental. You have to set the rules for your kids. Now, in this particular case, you're both parent and child. What rules do you set for yourself? How do you evaluate yourself? Did you do well on this thing? Did you think well on that thing? And where are the weaknesses and how can you improve it? Now you'll notice that in any other kind of function in life, that kind of thinking is real important. An athlete has to think that way about himself. An actor has to evaluate his own performance. I did good here. I didn't do good here. This needs more work while well, I'm doing okay here, but, you know, I need to do this or that or the other thing. And there's the temptation to be pig-headed too or get tired or want to give up. You have to learn to think for other people because you're going to be setting the rules for your kingdom. That's what Christ had to do when he was down here. He had to get, he had to build an entire thinking pattern out of the Old Testament. And that thinking pattern is what we're learning now as believers. Okay, that's what that's what Paul's talking about in you know at the end of uh, Colossians one, in First uh, Corinthians um, twelve, beginning at verse thirty one through the end of chapter thirteen. He leads that off of 1 Corinthians 1, five. He's talking about it in Galatians three through five. He's especially talking about it in Ephesians. To come to know the love for Christ, which goes beyond, you know, mere academic knowledge. That's Ephesians 3, 15 through 19. You are literally in the same training program Christ was in. Everything with God is God level, not human. That's why only the Holy Spirit can execute the spiritual life. That's why 1 John 1, 9 is absolutely critical. If you're not using it, you're not growing. You're retrogressing. So it's like, hi, I'm this king in training. There's protocol, there are rules, and you have to set them. And you're going to be graded on, okay, did I set the right rules? And you have all kinds of issues there. Now you have to think like a lawyer. The crafting of law that you're making for yourself. Because you're basically developing into a, a, a mindset that's a ruler's mindset. And the first person you got to rule is you. Now, that's a real dicey thing, and I'm always screwing it up. And you will, you know, you know, we always do. It's like, well, okay, how many rules do I have? Too many rules is just as bad as too few. You can't afford to be too lenient, and you can't afford to be too strict. You have to learn, the, you know, about give. You have to learn to forgive yourself. Okay, well, how realistic should you be? So you, you're parenting yourself. Well, parenting, as any parent will tell you, there's no handbook on parenting. Everybody's always guessing. Well, that's what you're doing. It's frustrating. And it's very time-consuming. And it's very slow. And it's very, you know, uh, punctiliar. You'll, you'll either be too harsh on yourself or not enough. Okay, so we've got three analogies now. We've got royalty, executive, parenting. Now maybe you've got a different kind of frame of mind. So let's talk about programming. In programming, that's also you have to have the big picture in mind. You have to understand all the different procedures that you're going to have to write code for. And how flexible is that going to be? You know, code, the big goal with code is to keep it as small as possible. The big goal with law is to have as few rules as possible. Okay? Law needs to be small 
and core and flexible so that the individual has enough freedom as a result of those few laws to actually live his own life and make his own decisions. And the idea of good law or good computer code is that it allows the user to make the maximum number of decisions and yet doesn't wreck the kernel of the program. Okay, so if that, that's the fourth analogy. Another analogy would be, well, let's see. Um, if all those other analogies didn't quite work for you, how about how do you plan your day? And it's the same issues, really. Do you plan your day down to the minute? When you do that, you're going to screw up your plan faster. So you learn to, okay, well, I'm going to block out categories of time. And you've got to block out time for rest. You've got to block out time where you do nothing or you have no rules. You have to block out the no rules time, too. You have to block out the rest time, too. And so you say, okay, well, I'm working from 8 to 5 on X. And you have maybe a to-do list. Some people, they, they need to plan out minute by minute. And, of course, in some occupations, you really do have to do it that way. The Royal's life is, is programmed like that. But that's not good planning. Because you always have to allow for what goes wrong. Because you don't have 30 or 50 servants who can be doing stuff for you so that you can afford to micromanage your own time. You don't have somebody where you can call them and say, you know, I need this sent to the dry cleaners and somebody else does it for you. You can't do that. You have to do your own trip to the dry cleaners. Okay, well then you have to allow for a lot of things going wrong. And then there's all the people that you interface with. You can't micromanage them either. You can't expect them to deliver in precise timelines the way you want. You have to learn to be flexible with them. And that's all teaching you about grace. Because God knows what's going to go wrong that day. And a lot of things go wrong in a day. And he's, he's letting you see how he works in your life when this stuff goes wrong. And also when it goes right, so you learn to appreciate it. The biggest thing that, that comes out of this is you gain an appreciation for what it's like for God to be God. What it was like for Christ to have to live down here. Constantly you're monitoring your thinking. Constantly you're analyzing. Constantly you're questioning. Did I make the right decision here? What's the right decision? Why is it the right decision? It's very, very tiring. But that's how the executive lives. That's how a ruler lives. If you're planning your day, that's how you need to live. Because you have to have a plan, and then you have to work your plan. And if your plan is too fragile, meaning too precise, then your plan's not going to work. If you have too many laws, too many rules, you don't have enough grace allotment in there, enough slack, then it's not going to work. At the same time, if you just don't organize anything at all, you'll never get anything done the way it should be. Okay? So maybe you're a structural engineer. Okay, think in structural engineering terms. Those same rules apply. It isn't, you know, just restricted to the other five things I said. And, of course, if you're a parent, you understand this full well. You never know if Johnny's going to have a nosebleed at school. And you're planning, you have to plan your day not only for yourself, but for your kids. So it's like being a structural engineer. You have to have give. If you're building a plane or a car, you have to worry about, you know, torque. You have to worry about, you know, um, turns and directions and, and, you know, all kinds of, I don't know, all the technical vocabulary. But the basic idea is that a body in motion is subject to certain forces upon it. And therefore, you can't afford to have the vehicle put together, you know, too tightly. It's got to have some give, but not too much. Otherwise, the vehicle falls apart. Okay? And, you know, if all that doesn't work, well, think about the way you organize where you put your stuff in your home. You've got to have a place for everything. 
How do you organize it? Is it just willy-nilly? Well, then that's going to cut on your time. Do you have to have, you know, the, the, the what do you want to call it, the pencil um, box exactly 2.2 centimeters from the edge of your desk? Well, something's wrong with your planning then. It's not to say that there's never a time when you shouldn't be that precise. But if you get anal about the details too much, it depends on the circumstance, depends on the issue. Sometimes you have to be anal. But a lot of times you don't. And a lot of people end up getting real anal. Oh, it's not perfect unless it's 2.2 centimeters away from my desk. Okay, well then you're not going to make a good ruler. But just look at the layout of your of your apartment. Where do you put things? What thing needs to be in a certain place so that you don't have to bother remembering because you've got some mem- mnemonic like, okay, well, you know, clothes go in a closet. Okay, if you've got anything besides clothes in that closet, you're going to want to have some kind of theme for the name, for the type of stuff you put there. So you don't have to think about it. And then, of course, it's like spacing. How do you design, you know, your furniture? Where does it fit? How, what angle does it go? Does it go to the front or the back of the room or in the middle? And how flexible or inflexible are you about that design? It's all about design. It's all about the big picture design for functional efficiency, for freedom. You know, if you put a bunch of boxes in the middle of your room because you're too lazy to figure out where to put them, okay, you got to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, go to the bathroom, honey. You're going to trip over the boxes, maybe break your leg, and then guess what? You've just eliminated your freedom for six weeks or a month. I mean, that was basically why I sprained my arm. I wasn't paying attention. You bet I'll remember to look where I'm going from now on. You see? And you're you're getting the results of your decisions. You're getting immediate feedback, and it's all happening in your head. And, of course, you've got some complementary actions that go with what goes on in your head. You see where I'm going with this? So that's what you have to do. It's big picture, spiritual life. You're a king in training. So how do you rule? You can figure the ruling out by, okay, role play, you're king. Or role play, you're CEO of your life. Role play, you're parenting yourself. Role play, you're a programmer of your own life, your own thoughts. Role play, you're planning your day and the day of others because everybody depends on everybody else. Okay, role play, structural engineering. Role play, the order of the things and where they are, what they are in your house so that you can find things. You know, some people, they get they, they have this little routine. They put the shaving brush on the left-hand side, the toothpaste is next, the this is next, this is next. So they can go bing, 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 bing in the morning without even having to think about it. Soldier, there's another role play item. Because, boy, Soldier has to get his procedures down pat, baby. Because he has to be able to do the same thing without thinking. He has to be able to assemble his gun in 10 seconds, 50 seconds, 60 seconds, depending on the kind of gun it is, without even thinking. Because what if his gun breaks down when he's in the middle of a firefight? So think of yourself as a soldier if you want. Whatever analogy works for you for what you're familiar with, start there. Notice that it's about all about command and control. You're in charge. You have to make decisions to get to a certain goal by the end of the day. So what kind of rules do you set up to get to your goal? Now notice what's happening here. You are, in fact, doing something that you would be doing in secular life if you want to be efficient. So there's a familiarity there. 
you are also doing something that you wouldn't recognize as being a good deed. You're organizing your life. And you're organizing your life around your destiny of future kingship, even though you're guessing. It, your purpose is to organize it that way for that reason. So now, God is first. You're orienting to God's plan for your life. And your decisions, you're organizing your decisions based on that. Not based on your preferences. Not based on what you like or dislike. But based on His plan for your life. Based on His will. Okay, well, you know what you've just done? You're doing a good deed greater than any deed can be done because you know what? That's the first commandment. If you're going to love God with all your heart and soul and mind, then everything's got to be based on Him. All your thoughts have got to be based on Him. Well, that, that's like practicing piano. It doesn't happen all at once. You have to learn to think on multiple levels. But your motive and your basis for doing this is Him. His will for your life is, I want you to be a king. I want to mature you as a king. Okay, well, how do I organize myself then for that to happen? It means a certain amount of time every day. It's going to be spent on Bible class. You got that, which then means that you got to eat at a certain time. You got to wash at a certain time in order for all those things to be met as goals. Okay, but you know what you're doing now? You're sacrificing yourself. You're not thinking about it that way because you're too busy trying to get to the goal. That's what Paul is saying in uh, Philippians 3.14, which uh, the Holy Spirit just threw into my mind. I'm pressing toward the goal of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Paul isn't talking about him sacrificing himself. He's not thinking of it that way. It's what he's doing, and he doesn't. he's not shy about admitting it in other verses. But the mindset is, hi, here's this future goal. I, God wants me to be a king. You are a crown prince under Christ the minute you first believed in Christ. Of course, Christians don't know this. Because it's not talked about in the pulpits. should be. If you knew this was what it was when you first believed in Christ, you would start out the Christian way of life on a very different footing. If you were born into the royal family of Britain or Sweden or somewhere else, this is what you would have been told as soon as you could hear it. And you would have been told it over and over and over and over and over again. It's a rule. It's a fact. It's your future. You are to inherit a kingdom. You must learn all the trappings and all the roles. You're not busy sitting there going, Oh, gee, I'm important. I'm going to become a king. No, you're busy trying to learn the procedures. And it's a 24-7 job. Even down here on earth. Okay, so you really are sacrificing your life. But it doesn't feel like a good deed. Because you're basically doing stuff in order to be efficient. Which everybody needs to do. So it's obviously benefiting you. So you're not thinking of it as, to, as a sacrifice. You're thinking of it as a goal, a future, and a benefit. And it is. So, you're not looking at it from the standpoint, oh, gee, I'm important. I'm supposed to be a king under the king of kings. I'm a Christian. You're not spending time like that. It's like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What's this rule? What do I do? It's very worrying. And you can see why it's a sacrifice. Because everything's going to be determined by God's will for your life. This future that when you die, that's where you're supposed to be. You're supposed to die crowned. Like Paul said in um, 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. That's the finish line of the marathon race. So you really are giving your life to Christ. 
You're organizing your entire life around God's will for your life. But unfortunately, the pulpits don't tell us what that will is. I mean, the Bible's real clear about it. Christ in you, the confidence of glory. Okay, well, who is Christ? See, pulpits don't spend any time explaining who he is. He's the king of kings. We all know these words. Okay, well, we don't know what they mean. If he's king of kings, well, you know what? He was born king of the Jews. What, a king doesn't have to train? It's the hardest job on earth to be a king. A king is constantly putting himself second and his kingdom first. So he subordinates every single thing in his life. And it's not, you know, it's glitchy. But the goal is subordinate, 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 subordinate to this purpose. I am Messiah. I must subordinate myself to my Messiahship. That's how Christ thought every day. That's why he talks about himself in third person. He's thinking of himself as an entity, of his office, of his role. You know, I, you can hear some of the dippiest things from theologians. I just want to throw up. Well, Christ is talking about himself as a third person, and only crazy people do that. No, he's being objective, dummy. It's not I. It's the Son of Man. You know, he's always saying the Son of Man. He's relating to his office as Son of Man. He doesn't use the first person. Sometimes he does, but most of the time he talks about himself like this thing. Well, that's how you have to think about yourself, too. You are a king in training, a king in training, a king in training, a king in training. Okay, what must the king do? What would make this work? Okay, but then the king is subordinating and sacrificing, but the king is not thinking of himself as doing that. He's going after a goal. And he's dedicating his whole life to that goal. And that fulfills the first commandment. So you see, it's the greatest good deed you could do because you're doing the same thing that Christ did. Peace out.